We also celebrate Pentecost today. And so I want to spend a little bit of time setting up the sermon, and I'm going to close the sermon with what does it all mean for us? What's the significance of this? So I want to start in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we have Genesis 11. It's the account of the Tower of Babel. After the flood, God gave to humanity the direct command, I want you to go and settle everywhere. I want you not to stick together, but I want you to go into all of the land and populate it. Mankind said, no, we don't want to do that. They stayed together. They came to a place called Shinar, and there they built a city. And in particular, they built a great tower. It's not like building a tower was bad, but it's why they wanted to build the tower. They wanted to say, in a very egotistical way, look at how great we are. Look at what we can accomplish. And so what God did was he confused their language, forcing them to go to different places, congregating with individuals that spoke their same language. So that's the significance of the Tower of Babel, or Babel, either one, you can say it either way. So what happens at Pentecost is God, in a smaller scale, reverses the curse of the Tower of Babel by allowing that church, the Christian church, in that first area and those Christians to speak different languages. So the Tower of Babel and the, co- the course The curse of the Tower of Babel is reversed. But that's just a small thing. What's the greatest significance of that first Pentecost is that God gives to the world not a universal language, but a universal message. A universal message of God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ. A universal message of God's grace and peace that is bestowed to us through the crucified and risen Lord. That's ultimately what's going to change hearts and minds. And it's interesting, when we compare those two accounts, Genesis 11 to Acts chapter 2, the egotistical desires of humanity always remain the same. Look at us. So the significance of that first Pentecost is God gives a remedy for humanity, for our own brokenness that rests in the gospel. So what was the first Pentecost? Let me read this account for you. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. So what was Pentecost? Pentecost was a day, a celebration day, that came 50 days after the Passover. And there were two significant events related to Pentecost. The first one is that it was uh, the Old Testament church's first Thanksgiving. So it was the first harvest of the spring. So God's people were encouraged by God to gather together the first fruits of the land, the first harvest of the year, and make them as an offering to the Lord. The second aspect about Pentecost is also significant, is that Pentecost served as a reminder for God's people of the law that God gave at Mount Sinai. So every single year at Pentecost, as the first fruits were brought, God's people would come together and celebrate the giving of God's law, God's standards, God's truths. So the Bible doesn't specifically say this, but I think we can kind of put pieces together. If all of God's people on a yearly basis are getting together, celebrating their thanksgiving, and getting also together to celebrate and commemorate God's law. How do you commemorate God's law? Well, you commemorate God's law 
by speaking. So we could think that it was a tradition of God's people to gather on, at Pentecost and recite the law, recite the Ten Commandments. So that kind of fits this picture as to what's going on. First of all, they're all sitting, so nobody's preaching, because if somebody was preaching, that person would be sitting down and everybody else would be standing up. So they're following this ancient tradition for 1,400 years, gathering together on Pentecost, reciting the Ten Commandments. And then there is the sound like the blowing of a violent wind. That's kind of interesting. It's the sound of the blowing wind. It's not the wind. It sounds like a blowing wind. So it's not like there's gale force winds coming in through the windows and everybody saying, oh my goodness, the storm's coming up. We better close the windows. People's hats and coats are blowing away. That's not what's happening. It is the sound of the blowing wind. So it hears, it sounds like there is this huge force, this huge wind that's going through there. But it's not blowing. How do they see the evidence of the Holy Spirit? They see the evidence of the Holy Spirit by the fire that rests on their heads. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So again, the Bible doesn't specifically say this, but I think we can surmise the truth that they're following that tradition of gathering together, reciting God's law, reciting God's commandment, and they keep following that tradition, and then, all of a sudden, some of them start speaking in different tongues. Real language, not, not gibberish. Real languages that are discernible to others. So the first Pentecost, then, when we read the text, that first Pentecost that the Spirit is poured out on all of those 120. Acts chapter 1 talks about the 120 gathering together to replace Judas. They pick Matthias, and then Acts chapter 2 begins with the truth. They're all together. They're sitting, maybe reading or reciting the law, and the Holy Spirit is poured out. Someone after the, the first service also made an interesting application. So, so just in the Old Testament, the festival of Pentecost was celebrating the first fruits, first fruits of the land. That first Pentecost ultimately is celebrating the first fruits of a crucified and risen Lord. So the significance of Pentecost is far-reaching. So if you're, you're sitting there right now saying, great, thanks for the history lesson. There's a, maybe a couple of things I didn't know about. Uh, I appreciate that. But you're thinking, so what does it mean for me? Great, Pentecost. We have the Red Pyramid. First Sunday to kick off the summer. We celebrate Memorial Day. It's everything for us. It means that our fears can be displaced. It means our hearts can be stirred. It means our lives can be filled with joy. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit has been poured out into our hearts and lives through the significance of Christ's death and resurrection. God's grace is free. God's forgiveness is ever flowing. God's pardon is permanent. And this impacts us in our lives because of the gospel. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is the all-pervasive force in the world. That's what changes hearts. That's what changes lives. And when people approach lives without the gospel, without the good news of Jesus Christ and the sufficiency that Christ offers, that's, what's bring, that's what brings emptiness and sorrow. Timothy Keller, arguably the greatest Christian apologist of the 21st century, 
recently died in his book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, asked the question, what, do, what is your greatest desire? What is your greatest desire? In a superficial way, maybe our first response, without thinking about it, is going to say, well, I don't know, health, wealth, and happiness. You know, I want that. Good responses. Nothing wrong with that. But what is God's greatest desire of us? God's greatest yearning of his heart for us. He says there's four things that God desires. The first thing that God desires is that we would come to a knowledge of who he is and what he has done. The second thing is that God desires of us to understand ourselves, our strengths and our weaknesses and strive to conform our lives to the gospel. Second thing that God does, or the third thing is God desires of us to be compassionate individuals desiring to understand the trials and difficulties that other people are going through. And the fourth thing is a profound trust in God amidst life's uncertainties. How do we get that profound trust in God amidst life's uncertainties? by having just a wonderful life all the time. Everything always coming up roses for us, having that proverbial yellow brick road that we walk on. No, we have that trust in God and it comes to us in our lives through trial. As trials come to us in our lives, it refines us and it defines us. And in that life, we strive to conform our life to God's will. Without the truth of the gospel, when we experience life's difficulties, there's three things that we'll do. One, we'll blame God. God's angry with me. God doesn't love me. God's forgotten about me. It doesn't work that way. God loved you that much when you look at a cross. Another thing that we will do when we experience trials and difficulties is we will blame ourselves. And we'll say, um, I did this, God is punishing me. This is why this is occurring to me in my life. Another thing that we might do is we'll just blame other people. The truth of the gospel message is that God's love for us is just beyond our comprehension. And that it all comes to us through the power of the Holy Spirit living and dwelling within us. Our fears are real. But as we see the truth of the gospel, they can be displaced. Our hearts can be stirred because of the truth of forgiveness that comes to us through Christ. And our lives can be filled with joy, knowing that the big picture has been taken care of. And God supplies for us strength along our ways. The significance of Pentecost, very significant for us. The Holy Spirit lives within you. May your fears be displaced. May your hearts be stirred. May you be filled with joy, not just today, but every day. Let's speak these verses together. Let us go in the power of our Lord to work, live, love, and serve, for his presence is with us who gave his life for us and who now sits at God's right hand, interceding on our behalf. Let us be still and know that God is with us.
Thank you for spending your Sunday morning here. Thank you, girls, Billy and Noel, wonderful. Next week, uh, Trinity Sunday, we're going to take a look at a great commission from a magnificent God. Until then, go with grace, live in peace, have a good day.